Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar with Clean Horizon where we'll be examining the case for energy storage in Greece and why it is set to become a key European market hub. I'm Andy Colthorpe, editor at Energy Storage News. I'm very happy that today we'll have the opportunity to shine a light onto a market that looks set to emerge rapidly through a combination of drivers. Uh, which are based on Greece's specific circumstances as a country and as part of Europe and the European Union. Of course, we'll also hear about the challenges that need to be overcome for this emergence to take place successfully. Now, Greece gets 50% higher solar irradiation than Germany does, and solar power generation there has already overtaken coal. Just in the past few weeks, our sister site, PV Tech, has reported on, for example, the creation of a joint venture uh, by a portfolio company of Macquarie's Green Investment Group and developer Watcrop to deploy 750 megawatts of solar PV in the next four years. Lightsource BP has entered the market and is co-developing 640 megawatt peak of solar. And in the country's most recent renewables tender, which took place in May, 350 megawatts of solar bids were successful. Wind resources are also plentiful in many parts of the country, and as you'll hear from our expert speakers, renewable energy ambitions and targets remain high. As a country with urban populations as well as many islands, there are strong possibilities for different types of energy storage projects, from utility scale to distributed commercial and industrial, and microgrids that pair generation with storage. For example, this year, Greek industrial group uh, Mytilineos has acquired a portfolio of solar and battery storage projects in a 56 million euro deal. And that includes 21 battery storage sites and four solar plus battery projects. On the other side of the coin, you may also have already heard about the project at Tilos, the Greek island which has run almost entirely on renewable energy uh, since about 2017. But aside from this early activity, investor certainty and the economic situation post pandemic are among the more challenging aspects of market development. And really, we do hear so often that different regions of the world have great potential for energy storage. While the fundamentals of the clean energy transition and need to modernize the world's grid are such that this could be said to be true of every one of those regions, the realization of potential doesn't happen overnight and takes a lot of work. Luckily, as you're about to hear, it appears that Greece's government and regulators are in recognition of the need to push forwards. Clean Horizon CEO Michael Salomon will talk us through some of the facts and figures, explain the drivers and present and forthcoming market opportunities. Clean Horizons analysis of the market has shown that the fundamental drivers for energy storage in Greece are strong, and we can take a look at some of the specifics in his presentation to follow. We are also very fortunate to be joined today by Konstantinos Pitsinis, who is Director of Branch Market Design and Monitoring at Greece's Transmission System Operator, IPTO, and Dr. George Loizos, who is the Head of Electricity Networks and new technologies at the Regulatory Authority for Energy. And just before we start, I'd like to note that both George and Costas are speaking on their own behalf. Uh, while the data they present comes from their organisations, answers they give to audience questions and their views are personal opinions, not, not representative of the transmission system operator or regulatory authority. But we do look forward to, to hearing their expert views on the important role of energy storage in Greece. And of course, as always, we look forward to hearing from you, the audience. So please put your questions for the speakers in the questions tab on the right-hand side of your screen. And we will save 10 to 15 minutes after the presentations to answer as many of them as we can. And so without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to our first speaker, Michael Salomon. Good afternoon um, and good morning uh, to, to those of you that are joining us from the other side of the Atlantic. Thank you, um, 
Andy for, for this introduction and thanks to Caroline and the rest of the solar media team for helping, uh, putting, uh, for helping us putting this, uh, this webinar forward. So my name is Michael Salomon. Uh, for those that don't know me, I've been running Clean Horizon since I started the company in 2009. And we have been uh, since then and still are a one-stop shop energy storage consultant um, acting pretty much all around the world, uh, wherever we believe there's an opportunity for storage. And, and we serve both as a market analyst and as a technical consultant. So uh, I guess I'd, I'll just say a, a, a quick, um, uh, um, you know, a quick intro, uh, a quick follow-up to Andy's intro, and then I will let uh, George um, uh, from from the regulator uh, introduce, I would say, the basics of Greece, while while Kostas from from the Greek transmission system operator will go a bit a little bit in more details in, in the way energy markets uh, are organized in the country and then I'll and then I'll I, I'll use uh, what they've said to uh, to essentially show you guys that indeed there is a potential for very profitable uh, uh, energy storage business case business models in Greece but before so before I let them uh, you know I let them speak I, I I wanted to say one thing. So first of all, you will get the, the slide, so you don't need to to screenshot it or to read through it very very briefly. Um, I just thought I, I would put those those words there, so so everything is clear. But I guess the main reason why we are all here today uh, is specifically prompted indirectly by the European Commission, as you as you may know. Uh, all across Europe, there's this um, uh, funding facility called the Recovery and Resilience Facility that has been designed to support, I would say, the emergence of Europe from the COVID crisis. And each country was was allocated some grants. And in terms of Greece, 17.8 billion of grants uh, uh, were allocated by the uh, by the European Commission. Um, specifically now, and, and out of these this funds, more than a third of it will be uh, dedicated to the energy transition, which is fine, okay, great, but really the reason we're here today is that very specifically 450 million worth of these funds will be allocated to the installation of 1.38 gigawatt of storage in the country, that's number one. Uh, yes, part of that Will be uh, will be provided for for uh, pump hydro, but probably the bulk of this this fund or this make this make it was will be battery or hybrid plants. The, uh, the the very very important thing to to keep in mind are the, the the next two points. Number one, the these funds are designed to cover up to cover up to forty percent of the capex of installation of the storage system. So who, for whoever in the audience that has been involved in energy storage businesses worldwide, 40% uh, subsidy on the CapEx is huge. I mean, it's it's better than, than the best funding scheme uh, out there, which is the investment tax credit in the US, which I think tops up at 26% of the CapEx. So that's number one. And number two, um, the Minister of Environment and Energy, Mr. Skrekas, specifically uh, announced to the market that there will be a, a tender to procure between 500 and 700 of these megawatts by the end of this very year. This announcement was postponed to actually to, to Q1 2022, but the goal is that by Q2 2023, uh, the government should have selected projects worth uh, between 500 and 700 megawatts of um, of storage projects in the country. So, voila. This announcement that you may have seen in the press prompted us to investigate a bit more the reality of the Greek market for energy storage. And what we're what what hopefully we are going to be able to convey is that even though obviously the regulations are still not set for storage, um, there's many moving parts. There is, if you wish this strong impetus from the uh, re recovery and resilience facility slash the tenders that were announced by the government on top of very, very strong market fundamentals that are super favorable to energy storage. That's according to us. So now I will leave 
uh, first George and then Costas, introduce a bit more in more detail, uh, I guess, the reality of the Greek market. And then uh, in the end, our sort of wrap up and put some numbers in front of what I've just said, which is that the market fundamentals are great for storage in the country. So George, the floor is yours. Hello, by, me, by my side, uh, I am George Loisos from the Greek Regulator. Today I'm going to, to talk about the Greek electricity context for those who, who do not know it. Uh, I'm going to, to describe uh, the electricity supply chain and the electricity mix. So in Greece, we we are a European country, one of the 27 countries. We follow uh, the European fra legal framework. We have a, a regulatory authority for energy, an independent authority. And uh, we have liberalized the electricity market. We, we have uh, generation, transmission, distribution, and uh, liberated uh, supply. Uh, the PPC, the old... Uh, uh, national company of electricity power public corporation holds 51 percent of the installed power generation capacity and the supply is also dominated by ppc the ppc has 60 approximately 65 percent of the market and the rest is to to other independent uh, suppliers in generation major players are um, um, ppc el pedison mitilineos with protergia Terna with Heron and uh, yes, and some other uh, smaller companies. And uh, the Greek transmission is uh, run by uh, inter, um, IPTO, power transmission operator, independent power transmission operator, which is owned 24% by state grid. And uh, the distribution system operator, which is um, which uh, has just been bought, uh, the 49% of um, Hedno ha has been bought uh, recently by Macquarie Bank. And the rest is uh, owned by PPC. The suppliers are, uh, have vertical uh, suppliers, which means they own uh, generating plants, and also, uh, which are uh, PPC, El Pedson, Protergia, Heron, and some, um, uh, some other companies only uh, they, they are um, applying uh, their energy activity only in the supply, but in volt, zenith, uh, volton, energy, and so on. So the Greece's electricity generation mix is dominated by natural gas, and as you can see in the graph, approximately 43%, 40, 40-45% into 20 to 20. And, uh, the lignite still represent an and, uh, important share, as you can see, 15%, and renewables, the, the rest 35%. Uh, so that's uh, a snapshot of the Greek market. Uh, now I'm going to, to discuss the goals of the National Energy Climate Plan. Um, in this, we have... Um, um, the National Energy Climate Plan is a strategic plan developed by the government with a roadmap to solve energy and climate issues by 2030. Of course, uh, as uh, Michael said, it is backed up by RRF. And uh, in order to allow new renewable energy resources and uh, increase the flexibility of the electric system and the liquidity of the balancing market. So, um, in Greece, the, we will have a, a delignitization until uh, 2028. So the graph on the top shows the gradual withdrawal of uh, the remaining uh, lignite plants in, in Greece. So by the end of uh, 2021, we will have uh, 1600 megawatts withdrawn. Uh, five units in uh, 2022 and three units in uh, 2023 and one more uh, uh, Ptolemaida 5 it will be withdrawn in uh, 2025 unless 
they change the, the fuel to natural gas, we will see. Also, in, in the bottom graph, you, you can see that Greece plans to, to double uh, the wind and photovoltaic capacity over the next 10 years. You can see how the graph is increasing. The, the renewable share will be up to 61% by 2030. So let's move to the following, uh, the following slide. I'm going to talk about the, the licensing figures in Greece that we have given the past uh, year, actually since the beginning on, of, uh, of this year. The, the numbers are evolving uh, very fast and the applications are, uh, are a lot because uh, the market has realized that there is a large potential in Greece. So, so far we have um, approximately 200 applications totaling 12 gigawatts and we have licensed more than 7 gigawatts until now. 527 uh, gigawatts uh, pure batteries uh, and 150 megawatts hybrid which is uh, batteries and uh, and renewable uh, energy storage units and pump, pump hydro storage 1.6 uh, gigawatts the, you can see that uh, the number of uh, the amount of uh, of uh, hybrid uh, units is quite small because in July, the, the ministry passed a law that uh, withholds the licensing for uh, hybrid uh, units until the until December uh, 2021. Uh, major uh, major companies that uh, have obtained licenses are again PPC, the major players in Greece, uh, Mitilineos with Medca, Dairin, which is um, a developer. Uh, and behind Irene is uh, NL, uh, also EDF, another uh, uh, Terna, another smaller players in in Greece. But uh, as you can see, all these uh, figures are valid for a week, and um, if we present this uh, in a week or ten days, we may see eight eight gigawatts of storage uh, license. We we have uh, improved the, our licensing uh, processes and we are uh, pro licensing uh, quite fast. We, in the regulator, we believe that um, there must be no barrier to entry and uh, the more the better for competition. Um, so uh, that's all from uh, the Greek electricity contest. Now we will proceed with uh, the second session, the revenue streams available in Greece and the storage system. And I will uh, pass the floor to Mr. Kostas Petsinis, the, the, the transmission system operator uh, representative. Kostas. Thank you, George. Um, okay, I, I would like to, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to make a brief introduction on the Greek balancing market and uh, give you some insights on uh, what are the opportunities for storage in Greece. Uh, I see a lot of people have already joined uh, the webinar. Uh, this is very promising. And I really hope to see some of you in the market uh, in the next years. I will start uh, with a very brief introduction on the market. So uh, unlike uh, most uh, European countries, Greece applies a unit-based uh, central dispatch uh, model. This means that uh, market participants do not schedule their unit, the units within their portfolios themselves. So scheduling of the units is performed centrally by the TSO. The tool to perform this process is uh, the integrated uh, scheduling process. Uh, on the figure on the right, you can see the four processes, the main processes that the Greek balancing market is comprised of. Uh, first, uh, we'll start from below the, the integrated scheduling process. So uh, balancing capacity or as more commonly known uh, reserves 
are not procured in separate auctions. Uh, they are procured within this integrated scheduling process. The integrated scheduling process uh, co-optimizes balancing capacity, balancing energy, uh, also system constraints, and uh, takes into consideration the technical characteristics of the units. So it is a very complicated process. Uh, to make a, a long sto story short, uh, balancing capacity is procured twice per day for two 12-hour periods. So the auctions take place approximately one hour before each of uh, the 12-hour periods. Uh, now I am moving to the next process, the automatic frequency restoration reserve process, also known as automatic generation control, AGC. Uh, this process requires real-time bidirectional communication with the TSO. So it's uh, not very easy. Uh, activations are performed every eight seconds. Um, offers can be submitted in this process uh, up to 15 minutes before real time. And so we have offers for both directions, that is upwards and downwards. The pricing for this process is hybrid. And this means that uh, it is mainly uh, pay as bid, the compensation is pay as bid. However, one should receive at least the price, the marginal price that comes from the next process that going to speak right now. So the next process is the manual frequency restoration reserve. This is a much easier process to be pre-qualified and uh, to participate in. Again, the offers can be submitted up to 15 minutes before real time. Uh, and the TSO uh, runs this process every 15 minutes. So usually the activations are done every 15 minutes. However, the TSO has the right to activate directly uh, anytime. Um, well, th this is uh, the design of uh, the MARI process as well. The MARI is the, is, is the European platform for uh, activation of uh, manual frequency restoration reserves. This process is compensated marginally. So there is a marginal price here. Moving to the last process, the congestion management. Uh, this process, we, we do not have separate offers for this process. So we are using the offers that were submitted for the manual frequency restoration reserve. We also use some uh, location and information in order to activate assets that are in a particular area and uh, alleviate congestions. So this process is again uh, compensated pay as bid. I just, I think I forgot to say that also the capacity, the balancing capacity is also compensated pay as bid in the Greek market. Uh, I will now move to the participation rules for storage. Uh, I will not get uh, in too much detail here. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the participation in, uh, in the market for storage is voluntary. However, it can be mandatory in two cases. Uh, firstly, in case storage receives uh, a state aid, uh, in this case, uh, the exact rules will be in the state aid documents. Uh, for example, uh, if somebody participates in a capacity remuneration mechanism, then there should be uh, mandatory participation in times of uh, shortage of energy. And secondly, the participation in the balancing energy market is mandatory in case or for the periods that somebody has been awarded with balancing capacity. Balancing capacity is, uh, is, a, is a promise to give energy in the future. Therefore, the participation in balancing energy is mandatory. We can see here, uh, I will tell you how, how many products we have in this market. This is a complicated market. So there are three products for balancing capacity, uh, FCR, frequency containment reserve, automatic replacement reserve, and manual replacement reserve. And these products 
uh, have all two directions. So in total, we have six products for balancing capacity, which means that you have to separately bid for six products. And then for balancing energy, we have two processes, only frequency contain only frequency uh, manual replacement reserve and automatic replacement reserve. And we have also both directions. So there are four products for real time energy activation. In total, 10 products uh, for, for the balancing market. Uh, in the next slides, uh, we will see some statistics on volumes and prices. Uh, now I'm moving to the available revenue streams for storage. Uh, firstly, I would, uh, I would mention the price spread. Uh, so one can take advantage of the price spread within each market, the ahead market, balancing market, intraday market, or even across markets. For example, one could uh, charge a battery in the day ahead market paying the price of the day ahead market and then discharge providing balancing energy in the balancing market, thus being compensated with uh, the upward balancing price. So here relevant, here the price spread between the day ahead market and the balancing market would be relevant. Uh, we have already spoken about balancing capacity uh, with six products. This is also very interesting. Uh, for, for storage, uh, synergies with other technologies. Uh, storage uh, can also will be able to participate behind the meter with uh, renewable energy sources. In this case, one can manage better the renewable unit and among other, reduce the imbalances. Moreover, storage can increase the rest penetration in uh, congested areas. Moving to congestion management, uh, the TSO can, determined, ca can determine some geographical areas with local problems. These are called red zones. So portfolios with assets in these red zones can be activated and help alleviate congestions. Uh, this comes of course uh, with a payment. So this is a revenue stream for storage and is very important for storage and for the TSO as well. Now, uh, new services. New services. Um, so the need for uh, inertia and uh, fast uh, FCR in the future is deemed highly probable due to the decrease of system inertia because of the replacement of synchronous generators with non-synchronous technologies. So we might see in the future products, new products for this, uh, for inertia and fast FCR. Voltage control uh, currently is a mandatory service for production units and it is not paid. However, this might change in the future and provide another revenue stream for storage. And capacity mechanisms. Uh, I would like to say that uh, at the moment it is planned to submit a proposal for a new CRM for Greece in the next few months. And of course, uh, storage will be eligible to, to participate in, uh, in this uh, mechanism. Uh, well, I, I hope all this didn't sound uh, Greek to you. Uh, for, for some of you, it might be easy to understand, for some of you might not. I will continue with some statistics. So uh, this uh, should be easier for all of you to, to get a, a grasp on, on the prices and volumes that uh, uh, in, in the Greek balancing market. Uh, so uh, here we can see uh, the spread between the upward and the downward balancing energy price. Uh, I should say that these prices are average prices. Uh, we couldn't plot uh, actual prices which are calculated every quarter hour for this period. So in fact, uh, you, obviously the spread of actual prices is uh, much, much higher than what you see in this, uh, in this graph. And in fact, they can reach uh, to thousands of euros uh, within a day. Well, ac according to this chart, uh, the average price spread is 90 euros per megawatt hour and the maximum was uh, 250 euros per megawatt hour. But e even looking at, um, at average spreads, 
uh, I think the values uh, look uh, very promising. Uh, I should remind you that uh, balancing energy is uh, compensated marginally. Uh, now I'm moving to prices for balancing capacity, which is paid pay as bid. Again, uh, here you can see only average prices. And this is average per provider per period of the day for both directions. So again, the prices can be much, much higher. Uh, in fact, here you can see that uh, the most expensive uh, product is AFRR, the, the green line, which uh, on average reaches up to uh, seven, eight euros per megawatt. Uh, the, uh, the payment is per hour. So you can see here, this is, this is euros per megawatt for providing the service for one hour. Again, uh, we have observed uh, a lot of times higher prices, uh, as much as 20, very, very oftenly, and uh, up to thousands again, but uh, this is uh, quite rare. Uh, I will move to volumes now. Uh, you can see here an indication of, um, of the weekly volumes traded in the balancing market. I should say that these volumes uh, include all kinds of activations. Therefore, uh, they include balancing energy, they include redispatching or activations for other reasons like voltage control. Uh, so these are total volumes. Uh, if you take into consideration that uh, the total consumption in Greece is around 50, 52 terawatt hours per year, uh, the total volumes in the balancing market can range up to five to 10% of, uh, of the total volumes in the market. So this is again, very promising uh, for storage. Now uh, I will present to you a daily profile uh, for the volumes for balancing capacity. So these are the volumes that uh, were auctioned by the TSO on the 7th of July, 2021. Uh, you can see here the, the blue line is uh, FCR is fixed at 47 megawatts uh, and AFRR and MFRR are close with each other, but uh, they, they vary a lot. So uh, you can see a range from 300 at night, at night uh, in the morning, early in the morning, uh, up to 800 uh, in the evening where the, the needs and uh, the ramping is, uh, is, much, uh, is much more. Uh, lastly, uh, I will show you the same graph for balancing down capacity needs. As you can see, uh, needs for balancing capacity down are much less than for upwards. You can see maximum of 180 and uh, they don't vary that much. Uh, so, uh, uh, I hope uh, I shed some light uh, on the Greek balancing market um, and I will, I think I will give the floor to Michael. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kostas. Um, this was very um, informative as usual. I. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of people, judging from the questions I, uh, that I glanced at, I can see that uh, I was not the only one to learn new stuff here today, so I'm quite happy. I guess so, I, I'd like to, to take the floor and um, put the things that Costa said into context. So, two things that Costa showed and one that he actually specifically said. The first thing he showed is during one of his slides, he showed that the, the balancing energy was on the order of um, the amount was on the order each direction of 100 gigawatt hour, 100 gigawatt hour per week. So usually years tend to have 52 weeks. So that means that you'd be um, uh, after a year, both upwards and downwards, probably around four to five terawatt hour. So for those of you, those of you that have, I would say orders of magnitude in mind regarding um, um, electricity markets, that number uh, is actually more or less the same number you'll find in a country like France. France is much larger than Greece, electrically speaking. 
So what this tells you is that the ratio between the amount of balancing energy versus the total consumption of the country is probably, I didn't make the exact ratio, but it's probably between 7 and 10 percent. Whereas, say, in continental Europe, the number is closer to 1 to 2 percent. So that ratio of 4 to 5 already should tell you that there, that there is something specific in this country that, uh, that we should look into, meaning there is a lot of need of balancing, which is probably not optimal for, for, for the country, or not optimal for the, the rate payers in Greece, but it, 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 it's, it's optimal for storage because this is the kind of uh, situation that storage can help solve in, in a very economic way. That's one of the first things Costa showed and I'm trying to reinterpret using my uh, storage bias or my, you know, my, 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 my storage interest. Now, another thing he showed, he showed average numbers of the balancing prices, both upwards and downwards. Well, well, they're very, very high. <laughs> and, and the numbers he showed were actually average spreads. And as was discussed, it's, it's, a, pay -as, it's a hybrid pay-as-bid, so that was explained already. So meaning that every quarter hour, um, which is the, which is the, um, the time step on, in these markets, there is um, essentially, uh, uh, of course, there's an average price that you can compute, but there's also a minimum and a maximum. So, and again, for us in the storage space, what we like is uh, being able to not just get our spreads based on the averages, but to be able to go catch uh, some of the best spreads we can. So I prepared a, a very, I prepared, we prepared uh, this very simple graph, which by the way, uh, lacks AFRR, and I apologize for this, we didn't have the time to, to review it, but it, it, let's say, the numbers on, on AFR were not as impressive as the number on, on AFR, on MFR, and please bear with me. So what we, we just made this little table, which is a, a summary of a summary of a summary of, a, of our analysis, that just tells you if storage was participating in the market, roughly based on the numbers for 2021, actually we looked at, to be very transparent, we looked at data between November 2020 and I think it was last June, so six or seven months of data, which we extrapolated uh, to be able to make, uh, you know, business cases. We looked at how much money a storage could 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 um, generate if it was acting on those markets. So first, firstly, on the energy market, the day ahead and intraday markets, we're getting spreads that are here. Here, those spreads are expressed in megawatt hour. So that means the average, essentially the average uh, delta you're making by buying low and selling high, of course, at this stage, neglecting anything such as grid fees. As you can see, for those of you that are used to building storage business cases, it's nice, but really not sufficient. Where we got a bit more excited, obviously, is for the two lines in green. So the first line is FCR. So for those of you uh, that were sleeping through uh, what Costa said, FCR is essentially a frequency containment reserve. Mainly, you're being paid for your capacity, uh, the available capacity that is used to regulate the frequency kind of nonstop. And actually, in this country, in Greece, if, again, if you're able to get the marginal prices and not the average price that Costa showed, okay, so he's a honest guy. He's showing average prices. I'm trying to beat the system, so I'm talking marginal prices, then you could make something like 100,000 euro per megawatt per year. And I'll, I will cut along, make a long story short for you. In general, in Europe, if you want to, to repay your asset with maybe an 8% IRR over 10 to 15 years, you'd, you'd need something like 70,000 euro per megawatt per year, at least for a one hour battery. So that means that if you were, if, if, if as of today, your battery could participate in FCR in Greece, and if you were a savvy trader, you would make a lot of money. That's my second to last column. But my last column tells you that you would make a lot of money, but for a very, very small market. So probably it won't be interesting for so long. What I'm more interested in, and this is why we, we kindly ask Costas to provide a bit more insight as a transmission, as a TSO in Greece, uh, we ask him to provide a bit more insight on the balancing market is that if you were playing around, fooling around with your battery on the balancing market, actually, 
if you are only doing one cycle per day, okay, and assuming you were able to catch not the average spreads that Costas was showing, but actually the max spread that, uh, that you could, theoretically assuming that you could get that, you would actually make for each megawatt hour of battery installed, your annual revenue would be close to a quarter million euros. So uh, this is a lot of money. And this is the logical segue, logical continuation of what Costas was saying, of, of, what the, of the numbers he was showing, essentially based on A, as I recalled, as I reminded you, the need for balancing energy in this country, which is high, and also the average prices that already show a big spread. And if the average prices show a big spread, as you can imagine, the marginal prices can be extremely lucrative. So then we played around uh, and built a, a little, I would say, putative or theoretical business cases, business case for energy storage in Greece. So first of all, for those of you that are not used to, um, let's say, working with us, uh, um, let me just show you how I introduced, how this is shown. What I'm showing here is, uh, I'm showing everything here in terms of net present value, meaning I look at all the revenues on the left side of the screen that my storage, my, my storage asset could do theoretically, I'll go, come back to the theoretical point that I'm making here. But all of the revenues that it could make over the duration of the project, in this case, five years, uh, so both on MFRR and FCR, and those numbers are brought back to the present using an actualization rate of 8%, which means that if you're making 1 million euro this year, it has more value than if you're making 1 million euro next year. As a matter of fact, it has 8% more value. This is why I'm saying we're using an 8% actualization rate to bring everything back to the present. So that's on, on the revenue side, on the left side of the screen, on the light, the light blue ones. The dark blue ones on the right side of the screens feature the, the cost of running the systems. Essentially, it's CapEx, it's OPEX, and what we call here grid fees, which is actually be called grid fees and taxes, which we think are representative of of uh, a, a potential, what should be a real case in, in Greece, let's put it this way. And the difference between the total cost and the total revenue, um, I'm sorry, the difference between the total revenues and the total cost is called the net present value. As you can see, this number is positive and it's green. Now, another way to interpret this graph uh, that may be more, I would say, uh, usual to, to most investors in the room is to not just look at the net present value if you had an 8% actualization rate, but actually take all the um, uh, revenue numbers and the cost numbers and compute the IR. And in this case, it's 29% over five years. So I repeat, in this case, the IR for energy storage in Greece is 29% over five years. That sounds very good. It's unheard of in Europe. And as you can see from this little bar chart that I'm showing, is mostly thanks to I would say us catching some volatility, some volatility on the balancing market. Okay. By the way, yes, we've been uh, um, we've been both aggressive and conservative in the way we assume we're going to catch the volatility. Number one, we are aggressive because we're making two cycles per day with our battery. Um, that means that we're taking the best spread of the day and the second best spread of the day. So that's aggressive. But we've also been conservative because, as a matter of fact, even though we've decided to use a 20 megawatt hour battery, that is a two hour battery, we're actually only using uh, one hour per day. So really, we just have an extra 10 megawatt hour just used for, you know, contingencies. That's, so that's conservative. And obviously, we know that in real life, traders never catch 100% uh, of the, uh, you know, the best spread they could do on the market. We know that uh, uh, we know that um, uh, they uh, catch only a fraction of it. So we we, we reduced the amount of um, revenue they could make on the market. There, uh, I think we reduced it by forty percent. Uh, by the way, uh, the question. Okay, so I see questions popping up. I can't answer all of them, but essentially, I'm talking here unleveraged. This is even before leverage. Okay, so this is really uh, the amount of money you you would get. If you were uh, if you were 
participating with the battery in the market as of today. So what this means is don't invest just yet in Greece. Please do not do this yet because my graph says uh, dot, dot, dot in theory. Why? We made a lot of assumptions to build this. We made assumptions on the grid fees, which, is, which are very conservative. I won't get into this, but they're very conservative. And we also, of course, made assumptions that uh, the, six past, the past six months of, uh, of market value were going to repeat themselves for the next five years. Of course, we have not modeled this as of yet. And also, we assume that the rules to participate are there and participation is possible, uh, legal, and, and has a framework. Uh, voilà. And by the way, uh, yeah, voilà. that's number one. Th that, that's it. Um, but still, our angle here, the, the reason why we are, we are excited about Greece, as I mentioned in the very first slide that I showed, which is the government is pushing forward using building, bringing up tenders to the market, number one. And number two, it's using this with funds coming from the RRF, as I mentioned, which could fund as much as 40% of the CapEx, which, by the way, I have not included in this graph. The CapEx here I'm showing is the actual CapEx for a 10 megawatt, 20 megawatt hour battery. In this case, we used LFP. So those numbers are not here to tell you, <laughs> please take all, your, all of your savings and invest them in a Greek project. You do whatever you want, but I'm not advising that. What, I'm, what those numbers are here for is to show you that if you use this, the, if you look at the, the fundamentals of this market and make reasonable assumptions of how things are going to evolve, hopefully in the next six to 12 months, this is the kind of profitability, uh, uh, th this is how those numbers and those logical reasoning would translate in terms of storage business models in this country. So I strongly recommend, obviously, uh, being extremely careful to what happens um, in Greece. And well, obviously, uh, uh, don't go by yourself, don't go alone. Obviously, you need consultants. I will not tell you which one you should go with. Um, I think I saw a question earlier. Now there's too many that came. Uh, my colleague is trying to answer, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure she can answer as fast as they come. The, um, I think there was a question earlier that said, uh, well, the, the 450 million euros by the RRF that are supposed to, um, uh, that are supposed to fund those, uh, th those, uh, uh, those batteries or those storage systems don't disclose the duration of the storage assets. So they don't, do not say if it's going to have to be one hour, two hours or four hours or whatnot. Uh, the, the, the position I'm taking in this, in this development that I'm making is I, perhaps those the government tender will dictate that i have no information on that at least nothing that that is that i can share but what i'm saying is if i take a i would say a market approach to this the answer would, should probably be okay the, the answer should be that probably huh, that the, the, the investors will decide based on the amount of profitability they can they think they can extract from the markets slash based on the amount of storage they, they, they believe that the market needs. So if I look at the way storage gets developed in continental Europe, there is usually no mandate in terms of uh, uh, maximum sizes or there's only minimum sizes to participate in the market. And whether investors decide to go for one hour, two, hour, two hours or four hours is based on their understanding and forecast of how the market will evolve. Voilà. So sorry, it was a bit long, but I thought I wanted to uh, condense everything that was said earlier into this one graph. And uh, uh, voilà, if you have, um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you uh, all for your attention. I'd like to thank uh, especially uh, George and Costas for, for participating, Caroline and uh, Andy for setting this up, and Rosemary in the back who's trying to answer all of your questions. I don't know how she's faring, but uh, I would like to thank her as well. And Let's see if we can take some questions, uh, Andy, or what are, we have a bit more time, so perhaps we can answer some of them. Terrific, excellent. Thanks so much, Michael. And yeah, there's lots of questions coming in and lots of people on the platform. Just a few minutes to get them, get them answered. I would like to note that if you would like to follow up in more detail 
um, and discuss these, you, the email address is up on the screen there. It's contact at cleanhorizon.com. Now, that said, there's quite a few questions referring specifically to the tender and the auctions. And I guess my basic impression is that we won't exactly know how those tenders will look until they are finally released. Um, but there's a couple here that wonder if we can maybe just uh, see what our, our views are. Um, so uh, Julian in the audience was asking if the uh, recovery and resilience funding for the tender counts as, counts as state aid under European Commission rules. And does that mean that assets developed with funding uh, would be mandatory participants in various balancing markets? And does that erode the revenue opportunity for battery energy storage if it makes use of that tender funding? Well, uh, I think I can take this, uh, Andy, thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, as I already said, uh, this will be in the documents of the state aid. So if there is any uh, a, a, any rule for mandatory participation, we don't really know yet. However, I don't see for the RRF, uh, I don't see any reason to have mandatory participation. So a capacity mechanism uh, is there in order to uh, reassure the adequacy of the system. So uh, because of this, the participation should be mandatory. However, I think uh, that uh, only the ministry can uh, decide upon whether there will be something mandatory. But in any case, uh, I would see this as uh, something uh, that will be designed based on the, on the capabilities of storage. So I wouldn't see any barrier to entry here. This is just for storage. There couldn't be any rule for mandatory participation that would be a barrier to entry. Uh, but we should wait for that. Okay, sure, sure. And another question, I guess, that there's one for you, Costas, is uh, from Amela in the audience on the whether the transmission operator is going to adapt to the net imbalance mechanism of ENSO-E, so that's the uh, association of transmission operators with uh, you know several of those across Europe, for cross-border and cross-zonal balancing? And will that, I guess, the other question to that is, will that, how would that have an impact on, on the way you balance the system, I guess? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. The, there is, uh, uh, IGCC, which is uh, the mechanism for uh, imbalance netting across Europe. We already participate in that. However, uh, we don't have a border to participate. So we are ready, but since uh, Bulgaria and Romania are not participating in IGCC, uh, there is no border to exchange uh, mm -hmm. energy with uh, in Europe. Uh, this, in fact, would uh, reduce a little bit uh, the AFRR needs, but uh, I don't see any particular uh, effect on storage. Um, probably it will reduce a little bit the volumes of balancing. If I understand well the question, I'm sorry, I don't know if I understood well, but... Uh... Okay, so maybe that's one for uh, the audience member to follow up and uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe discuss it at a future day. Okay, there's a question here for, for from uh, Vikram who asks um, that the, so the tender is for uh, just under 1,400 megawatts of uh, storage, but licenses have been given for seven gigawatts um, already through the regulator. So I guess this ties in with another question of what's the definition of a license and where does that sort of leave the opportunity for new entrants? And I wonder if, if uh, George, this is one you can uh, briefly take into, or Michael, perhaps. Okay. Um, the definition of a license. The license is needed in order to be able to exercise the energy activity of, uh, of storage. Um, there are various, various beliefs how uh, you could uh, give the energy activity to someone. Uh, in North Europe, they just use a register. Everyone can participate. In, in Greece, we have um, 
some type of uh, of evaluation process which is not very heavy i mean it's intermediate in uh, regarding difficulty and uh, generally the trend is to simplify the licensing uh, procedures going towards having just a register uh, by simplifying the licensing procedure you, you increase the participants and you have uh, increased competition in any tender that you you will have in uh, in the country th th that's the theory the fact that uh, uh, for 700 megawatts electricity storage that the ministry is going to have a tender that will have um, uh, 7000 I mean, tenfold uh, more than needed. This is uh, a matter of the market, but it doesn't mean that all of them uh, will be uh, will be built. So I, I see there is no harm in uh, having a simplified uh, licensing procedures. In my opinion, I mean, I would, I am, a, uh, I support uh, even lighter licensing uh, procedures than. We, the one we have in Greece. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that, George. And I was just wondering on this question um, from Eleni, um, who's asking um, if the regulatory authority has any sense of the permitting process. Uh, All right. From, yes, yes. Yeah. The, in order having, to light, having light, having light uh, licensing, we, we mm -hmm. put uh, a heavy load in the we increase the administrative load of the TSO because uh, all of those uh, licenses they go to the TSO and then and, and they require uh, 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 connection uh, access to the network and the, the network is a limited sp the, elect the electrical space in the network as we know is limited nevertheless I I'm not supporting that in order not to create this uh, administrative uh, load to the TSO, you must uh, artificially invent a, a barrier somewhere before. So this is my answer to Ms. Kanachuli. Okay. There are, there are ways, there are ways to, to handle uh, every problem, but uh, the solution in my in my thought, is not to create uh, barriers previously. Absolutely. I mean, one, one thing I've seen from reporting on the US market, for example, is that interconnection to the grid, uh, the processes for doing that are somewhat complicated and, you know, considered a, a bit of a barrier. But Costas, from your point of view, you know, how closely have you looked at sort of interconnection procedures and what, what sort of uh, dynamics do you expect to see uh, when it comes to connecting large volumes of, of batteries and perhaps other storage to the grid? Well, there is a, a large volume of uh, uh, of applications, not only for storage, but uh, for renewable energy sources as well. Uh, there is a big uh, backlog of applications uh, in the system. I think that the ministry is um, is looking for a way to probably, I don't know, give some priorities to some of them or not. Uh, however, if we're talking about thousands of applications, you do understand that this cannot be done in, uh, in a few months. Uh, I'm not really an expert on, uh, uh, on this issue. So uh, okay. I think, uh, yeah. Okay, sure. And I think we maybe just have time for one more question, but as I said, Obviously, everyone's asked lots of, you know, really interesting, interesting uh, inquiries from the audience, uh, things that we probably don't have time to get into, such as the case for commercial and industrial energy storage, uh, which we've certainly reported on some of uh, in energy storage news, but not, not a huge amount as yet. But I understand that's a potential uh, use case as well um, for, you know, shaving energy costs. So we'll finish with the one um, again on the, the final one on the tenders, I guess. Um, and there's a few people asking uh, whether there's going to be a tech neutral, um, technology neutral approach to the tenders at all, uh, whether there'll be space for um, things besides batteries and pump storage, 
and kind of, you know, things like kinetic energy storage or thermal energy storage. Um, do we do we know whether there will be? Should there be? Um, anyone got any particular views on that? And yeah, I was just wondering if that's not, something. Not yet. Not, not yet. All the discussion is about electricity storage. Not yet. We, okay. we don't have any indication about it. It is. It has to be happen. It has to happen. But uh, at at the moment, for the following months, the ministry and the task force will be working only on electricity storage, batteries, batteries and okay. hybrid. Okay. So we'll wait and see what happens with that. Okay. Well, I guess that pretty much brings us to the end of today's session. Um, I'd just like to once again thank obviously Clean Horizon for working with us. I can tell that you know the audience have been hugely interested in this and I think Michael's really enjoyed interacting with a lot of you um, and sure that he would love, him and his team would love to follow up on a lot more of these topics. And certainly Kostas and, uh, and George, uh, we're Energy Storage News and Solar Media look forward to hearing more from you guys as well as, as things really develop in the market. So I'd just like to say thank you very much and thank you so much to our audience.